fortunate to have with us Irene Norsfels from DG Research, from the Unit of Innovative and Personalized uh, Medicines. I'd like to quote uh, Irene also for being one of the driving force person uh, with Ruxana Daglia uh, Akli, uh, the, the head of the health of DG Research, for putting together the International Consortium of Research on Rare Diseases and also in promoting uh, rare diseases on the research agenda for the next years, not only in Horizon 2020, but also INI. Now, my specific question to you, Iran is not to discuss really how rare diseases are a priority across all of that, but specifically how the Horizon 2020 and IMI can help to address the unmet medical needs in rare diseases. Before I do go into Horizon 2020, I have to tell a little bit about the story and what we have done in FP7, because that really sets the path uh, for what we would like to do in Horizon 2020. FP7 was the year the framework program where rare disease research really took off. And we believe that was built on a number of uh, circumstances that were put together. First of all, because we had invested a lot in omics research uh, through the years through a number of large-scale research consortia with research funders across the world. So we had a lot of experience in international cooperation. Also because we started to focus our efforts a lot on personalized medicine. And when you do go down that path, you immediately see that rare diseases is a very good model for personalized medicine. And therefore, a lot of attention were given to the area of rare diseases. And I'm quite proud to say that we almost uh, increased the research funding uh, for rare diseases in FP7 with almost 300% compared to FP6. We invested 620 million euros in 120 projects. Um, so some of the new ideas that we started to pursue uh, when we went down the path more in thinking and personalized medicine aspects was, of course, how could we apply all these omics technologies for rare diseases. So we kicked off a number of projects to more systematically apply omics platforms on groups of rare diseases. We also started to go down the path of linking this type of omics data with clinical data, what we would call the clinical bioinformatics, which leads to a number of other issues such as ontologies, etc. But it's something which is vital because there's no point for us to go on with the omics unless we really start to, to link it uh, with the medical side. We also um, tried to look much more into clinical trials, and we funded a number of projects in trying to improve the clinical trial methodolo methodologies for small populations. What really is going to sort of steer our path in Horizon 2020 will, of course, be IRDIC, the International Rare Diseases Research Consortium, uh, that we did kick off in FP7. It's now an an initiative where we have about 40 committed partners that together would like to ensure that 200 new therapies comes to the market before 2020 and that there would be means to diagnose most rare diseases by 2020. Quite challenging, but we are on a good path. And through IRDIC, we are bringing together the scientists across the world. We have partners from four continents today that are working closely together to sharing data and also uh, in view of setting the roadmap, identifying the gaps where the research investments are most needed. And there I would like to also express my thanks to Jan, who has accepted to be uh, the chair of the Therapy Scientific Committee. Um, for IRDIC, and I think that also shows how committed we are to also work with the patients and putting the patients into the center. Uh, we have uh, the uh, patients' organizations integrated in all the scientific committees and in the all aspects um, of the re research that we are trying to pursue. So IRDIC is working on policy guidelines for how to better share um, research results and the connectivity between different systems. And IRIC uh, is also working, and the three scientific committees of IRIC are also working on roadmaps, really looking at where we should do the new research investments. And that is also the path we are going to go because we are really committed to ensure that we are We have already started um, with the first work programs of Horizon 2020, as my colleague Terry. Um, has mentioned, um, so the calls are currently open and you may have seen that we do have a couple of topics which are specifically dedicated to rare diseases. 
Um, of course, to continue to fund the growth and drug development. And um, also to support the member states to work together through what we call the ERNX. It will be, uh, it's a topic open for that, and if that will be funded, it will be the third framework program in which we will fund a support system where we actually bring together the national research programs to come together and, uh, and fund uh, jointly uh, rare disease research. We also have a topic for European reference networks. Um, as you know, throughout the FP7, we have also been very dedicated to support SMEs, and we know that SMEs are very active in the area of rare diseases. And uh, what this, uh, one of the big novelties of Horizon 2020 is that we have a new SME instrument where we can go in and fund single companies. That is the first time. And we have decided from the health program that we would focus our efforts for the SMEs on the validation of biomarkers because we think that this is one of the biggest values of death for the SMEs. It's really to prove that the biomarkers um, are useful. And once that is validated, they can go into either the drug development path or to the diagnostic path. So we will dedicate quite a significant budget into that arena. Um, we, um, I am I. Uh, the, we are soon coming to a um, council decision for IMI2, which will be the continuation of IMI. Yeah. So IMI is one of the biggest uh, public-private partnerships in the world dedicated to health research. Um, IMI has the main objective to really uh, make the drug development faster. The whole aim is really to make sure that medicines are reaching patients much faster than before. And through IMI, there are um, a lot of collaborations going on, very much in the line of improving the way efficacy um, studies are made and also in terms of the efficacy studies, but also uh, coming along more on the lines of what Terry mentioned about knowledge management, uh, bridging together different um, uh, data sets, etc. Um, and IMI2 uh, will continue down this path and what is new in IMI2, the research agenda will soon be published, is that rare diseases are explicitly mentioned. Um, exactly what type of topics will come uh, through IMI2 on rare diseases remain to be seen. Uh, but we see that there is also a lot of interest from the larger pharmaceutical companies uh, to go wider than the part of rare diseases. So I believe that we will uh, um, continue our path in investing in rare disease research and hopefully we may not be able to increase by 300% but uh, increase even further than 10% in Horizon 2020. Thank you very much, Joanne. you may not have all these figures in mind that when you were talking about increasing the number of public being funded, so speaking about hard euros, uh, when you compare, when we started uh, this movement, there was 75 million euros dedicated to specifically to a disease project. In the next five years, it was about 250, if I'm correct, million. But in the last period, and the Delhi leadership, particularly, of Luxembourg and Iran, it was 600 million. And with this new approach, both in Horizon 20 and IMI, we hope it will be much more. Now, the question is not making it a, making what is it a priority or having money, but it's excellence. Excellence of the research to be submitted. This is what our challenge is today. Excellence in what we do. Thank you, Irene. And you mentioned SMEs, so I turn to the President and Chief Executive Officer of one of them. How we need to develop for us more treatments for more diseases, faster, better success rates? Okay. What are the four or five things we need to really do in the next five years to do? You should ask me a really hard question, Jan, because that was just too easy to be able to solve this in just 30 seconds or so. But it's, it's a great question, and thank you for the invitation to join. And I could never imagine a day when someone could say, by leaving Genzyme, I left Big Pharma. But indeed, there are many, many smaller companies than, than even at Genzyme. Now it's not a big, it's easy, that's right. Um, well, it's, it's very easy to explain why I'm sitting here. Um, I'm in a company of about 500 people. We are a, a small company with uh, many products, actually, as it turns out, and a revenue of about 300 million euros. 
it's a new or a company that's actually selling products but also doing kind of innovative work and, and research. Um, but the reason I'm actually sitting here is because Nick provided the vision and the leadership and the glue to bring together an unprecedented partnership to advance one of our products, Nick has known for the treatment of AKU, which was in most people's view, untreatable, unstudyable, and unfundable. So it was a perfect combination to spend our time on uh, thinking about, especially since I met Nick on my third or fourth day in my new job as CEO and said, you know, we're losing money, we have no money, I can see no way to make any money, and now we're going to do an unstudyable, unfundable, and do a new indication uh, for which we'll never get paid. And actually, that's actually exactly what we did. And, and the reason I'm sitting here is because on my other side is Irene, who through FP7 provided the platform that allowed us to create this partnership, which uh, upon which we were able to have a first of its kind discussion with the EMA to figure out how to study this unstudyable, unfundable, impossible indication. We're now halfway down that, that tenure road together. So to, to get to Jan's question, I just want to give a very quick view of, of why, I, after 15 years, I've never been more excited to be in the rare disease field and how to get traction on this question of translational efficiency. I started in the field by accident and fell in love with it because of the simplicity and the elegance of the science. I mean, in most of the rare disease fields, there's a pretty pure connection between the science and the disease. And then I got very really attracted by the effect signs that drugs and rare diseases can have. But there's very few diseases that affect many, many people because they're so complex. It can be truly transformational. Like that's what's exciting for me about rare diseases. But uh, if you get beyond the fact that in addition to all of that, rare diseases is where the most exciting cutting-edge healthcare policy is happening. For me, what's most exciting about rare diseases, and the reason I'm still in this field, is because it's fundamentally a field of children. That, that rare diseases have their origin almost entirely uh, in genetic disease, and, and those diseases are present at birth. And what's really fantastic about children is, they're well at birth, even with their disease. They have the potential to be well, and if we catch them at birth, and treat them at birth, and monitor them through a lifetime, they have the potential to stay well and to stay healthy. And I find that vision of rare disease intervention and management to be really a compelling vision that's worth dedicating our time to. And I think in many cases, that's why we're sitting here in the room here together. When I went to medical school, we were taught that kids died of trauma, they died of malnutrition, and they died of infectious diseases. And we were taught, really, that all the exciting science was going to happen with grown-ups. And indeed, for 90% of my colleagues in medical school and researchers, they went into research and, and innovative work for good reasons in the adult fields. But I think what the rare disease movement has taught us is that not only are most genetic diseases present at birth in kids, only to manifest through life, but an increasing majority of the largest and most prevalent and most deadly adult diseases have their origins in childhood, whether it's in genetics or in the way that kids are raised and, and are exposed to things in our environment. So what I'm trying to get to here is a view that if we want to reach this goal of 200 new therapies for rare diseases, we better figure out how to do it in kids. Because treating kids early is the best way to make a difference for a lifetime in the outcomes of, of rare diseases. So if we get to 200 new therapies, that's somewhere between one to 200 billion dollars of new investment, and at least one to 200 people with your energy, Nick, and companies who have a way to figure out how to get this done. So how are we going to do it? So in my view, it requires, to be a little gimmicky, eight Ps. So the first three Ps, I think, have to do with setting priorities. And I think Irene, you beautifully went through the very pragmatic evolution now of Horizon 2020 to figure out how to set priorities. Because being reactive as a group, having 45 different agencies that we all need to talk to doesn't work. We need to come up with a short list of priorities that can bring agencies together to make a call and bring them innovative um, proponents forward. The second P is, is pediatrics, as I said. I think the pediatric regulation is a great start, but it's not getting us where we need to go. Because it's become entwined and over um, committed to protecting child safety. That's not what the pediatric regulation in my view was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be about driving pediatric innovation, and it's not working yet, but it can work. 
finally, I think we need to acknowledge that if we're going to get to 200 medicines, they can't all be new. They, they must be out there today, but not applied in the right way to rare diseases, and in particular, and in particular to pediatrics. And why is repurposing so important for pediatrics? Because the reason we haven't studied pediatrics, remember the reason we founded the rare disease legislation in the United States in the 80s was not to serve rare diseases, it was to serve kids. That was the original purpose of rare disease regulation. But the reason we're not doing it is because we're so concerned about putting our children at risk in studying medicines. So I think part of the solution has to be looking at drugs that exist today, that have a safety profile and a safety track record. Okay, that's a quick review of the next five keys I want to talk about, but let me go through them anyway. The first is to meet a pathway. So what Nick did for AKU took at least 10 years of your life, and maybe 10 years off your life, I hope not. But it was a lot of work and a lot of problem solving. If we could take lessons from these and other collaborations and institutionalize them into a good market pathway, I think we could make a, a lot more progress. And, and for us, 2020, with things like the SME provisions, I think give us a, a way to start doing that where we can do more. Secondly, we have to acknowledge it's got to come through partnerships. It can't be on a standalone development model where one company funds everything from A to Z. It, it doesn't work. Thirdly, we have to come to grips with pricing. What do we do with companies that have late life cycle products with prices that are too low to support the new work that needs to be done? We can help solve the problem of the new work that needs to be done, but how will it be reversed over time? Fourth, intellectual property. If you have a late stage drug that's already on the market and you want to bring it to a new uh, indication, how do we protect that from an IP perspective? Either by extending the IP on the original indications or finding a way to create new IP around the new indications. And last but not least, I think we have to build on the prior session around this idea of personal responsibility for proof. How do we figure out, on behalf of patients and industry and regulators, how to demonstrate that an intervention works in life? Because so many great products now are struggling to find a way forward because we can't collect the data to show that they work. And that's something we have to solve together. Otherwise, the next generation of new products going to end up in a pain environment where people say, show me the proof, and patients say, data privacy was a, was a problem, I couldn't get my data in, or industry says, I couldn't get the collaboration right with academia, so we can't show you the proof, and payers say, you didn't do that because you don't want to show the proof, and so we're not paying. And so everyone goes like this, and in the end, we don't have the answer. So we've got to solve this personal uh, accountability for proof. Yeah, there's somewhere in here I can talk about pelicans and partridges and uh, <laughs> pennies and ponies and, and puffins, but I'll those are my those are my eight things. So thank you. Francis. Francis Arix is uh, from the Belgium National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance. In other words, he is the mayor <laughs> for Belgium. But what we know from Francis is that we don't know him as the mayor, we know him as Francis. Uh, he's working into European working groups to try to really stimulate his colleagues from other member states to collaborate together and exchange information on orphan drugs at the time of market authorization in order to speed up access. And, but my question to Francis is not so much about the MOCA, we're going to forget MOCA today. It's more uh, in the context of our discussions in MOCA, we discussed a lot the importance of early dialogue. So the question to you that we prepared is what, how would you see this early dialogue happening, this multi-stakeholder dialogue happening, and, and how to make it really feasible to address this unmet in the communities uh, so that we have all the parties involved from the beginning? Well, first of all, well, thank you for, uh, for inviting me and, and, and for giving me the opportunity to, to share a few thoughts. You have asked me to be provocative, so I'm, I'm going to try to do that uh, a little bit. And so is multi-stakeholder early dialogue desirable and feasible? No, it isn't desirable. It, we, I don't think it's desirable. I think we do not have any other option. We have to have this multi-stakeholder um, very early dialogue. And is it feasible? Yes, it is feasible because we are all already doing it. We are already talking very early um, well, not, in, not enough um, in orphan diseases and in uh, 
um, orphanage sale products, but, but certainly in the classic, in classical um, drug developments. And how do we do that? We there we rep make payers like ourselves um, and um, health technology agencies or health technology assessors represent society to go talk very early with the companies and with the people um, responsible for marketing authorization of drugs. Because actually for classical drugs, the, the, what society wants is not that complicated. It's, it's all, almost a, a, a mathematical algorithm. You know that you want therapeutic value and you can almost calculate um, what calculate um, um, how, how added value can be expressed. Um, you know that you want some, some sort of moderate budget impact. You know you, you, you have your figures for cost effectiveness. So it's easy to do. For, for orphan drugs, it's much more complicated. There, the needs are completely different. Um, added value is something very, very individual for very individual patients. Um, so your unmet needs are completely different um, and you really have to identify um, what you want. So how do you want to do this early dialogue? You have to involve um, patients very early in this dialogue. You have to set around the table the people, respond, the companies developing the products. You need the payers to be present and you need individual pay patients to be present. And there's one other um, group of people that have to be present in this early dialogue, and that is society as a whole. Um, and with that, I mean general public. Um, that's a little bit strange, maybe, but this year, um, I work for the National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance, and this institute um, exists for 50 years, um, this year here in Belgium. And there has been a study Recently, we, we have done a study, and it's going to be published um, this month, where there was asked to general public um, what they would prefer in terms of um, solidarity and in terms of um, what, what they expect f for health. And strangely, uh, and that's a little bit uh, terrifying, strangely, half of the Belgian people, half of the Belgian patients, prefer not to give life-saving or life-prolonging um, treatments to elderly people. Um, half of the Belgian people apparently prefer to um, withdraw reimbursement of drugs from uh, certain patient groups um, rather than uh, focus and rationalize the use of drugs um, in hospitals, for instance. So the general idea of the, um, we thought here in Belgium that there was some sort of a solidarity. The, the principle of solidarity existed very much and it still existed very much and actually that's not true. So what I'm trying to say here is that apart from the classical participants to the discussion on, um, on on what should be focused in the near future, and that is the patients and the, the companies and, and the government. We do need the general public to participate to this debate because apparently we're shifting away very much from the basic idea of solidarity. And I do know that that is not the answer that you were expecting from me. But I still wanted to give it because I'm a little bit. It actually these figures or this this result of this exercise frightens me a little bit. I'm afraid that people with orphan diseases are going to be left in the cold in the end if we do not have a shift of attitude in the general public. I think we'll agree. Uh, you're not applauded because your message is really strong and tough to hear. 
but that's probably what we uh, all fear and think, and that's why, as far as your audience is concerned, we speak a lot about working on the value of society and insisting on the importance of social justice and the fact that the most vulnerable people need to be supported and to have the right to hope and that there is some maybe difficult decisions to be made in the healthcare system or in the tax and etc. and allocation of resources but not to forget and not only about rare disease but also all people who are vulnerable. Uh, also the very aged population, uh, people isolated and not accessing care. I mean, there is, we're not the only one to be in that situation, and we have that in mind. The, if I can go back to a very specific, to, to try to make operational what you, what you said, for instance, is that if in this room we have another patient group like uh, AKU of NIC, and we have a company, uh, a patient group which doesn't have any treatment today for their disease, and a company who has a drug, either an innovative drug, a new drug, or a repurposing of drug, as Jeff said, with a potential. And together, they want to discuss with the payers and with the regulators, maybe, about the development. You know, just try to incentivize the company, to motivate them, to get involved in that development because they know that at the end they will be welcomed by the payers. Where should they go to have that discussion? I think the most efficient way to have this discussion is where the decision on funding is going to be. I, I know that the class, classic answer, answer, answer should be you should have that discussion in, in the marketing authorization assessment. I don't think it's true. I think it's when funding is decided. In the end, access is now, well, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, access was determined by marketing authorization. Now it isn't anymore. We have to be honest. It's, access is completely um, driven by funding of um, pharmaceutical therapy at this point in time. So you should have this discussion. Um, patient groups should be invited to the Commission for Reimbursement of Medicines this afternoon in Belgium, for instance. Well, and well, in Belgium is probably, it is what is going to happen. Probably not this year, but from 2015 on. Thank you, Francis, for being so honest uh, blunt and provocative, but I see in a very good way because it makes, I hope everybody got the message very clear that we need to look at the pathway differently. We need to anticipate much, much more the fact that at the end of the development, the lock or the unlock is with the payers and we need to find the right way to create that dialogue. Please. Actually, the answer is double. You should be, you should be you sh should start talking from the beginning. From the beginning, yeah. To make early dialogue. But you sh should still be in the room at the end. At the end. And that's a bit of, um, that is not happening. At this point, um, patients are invited yeah. to express their priorities, now their expectancy, and then priorities are set upon. And, and then patients are left behind. Yeah. And you're not in the room when we are discussing yeah. pricing and reimbursing. Yeah. When we're really discussing Jeff, Jeff, you wanted to flow now. Who are we talking about when we say payers? And what do we mean when we say patients? And many of us up here and in the prior panel have used the word stakeholder. And mm -hmm. we're all stakeholders today, but we will all some days, someday, be a patient, right? You're a payer today. I'm an industry representative today. You're on the government side, but one of us all of us one day will be a patient. So in the end, that's the interest we're working for. And I think one of the challenges that I, I perceive in the stakeholders chair I'm sitting in today and as a future patient is that to make happen what you're suggesting, we have to walk the divide between the level where you're working, which is at the, the, the very highest level of what does society want in Horizon 2020, down to the level of the individual country where at that level in a single payer system or way below that you have regional payers who are and then where do we have that conversation because it's it, as an individual company there's no forum today where we can talk to more than one payer at a time i mean maca has 
opened the door there a little bit, and Medev is trying to do the same. But I, how do we get that alignment between getting enough payers in the room who can say, yeah, we think these three or four things are top on our list, and we would fund something were it to come via Horizon 2020 or via X or Y uh, companies? And I, I mean, I know you don't have the answer, but I'm, I'm really interested to have the conversation about how do we create that platform so the payers who are ultimately representing all of us as patients can say, our top fire priorities, if they're met, would be things that we would, we would pay for, be interested in. We're not going to create this platform here in this room, but this is what we are doing now, actually, bit by bit, mm -hmm. by putting us, well, we're not around the table, but around the table, and start talking. And but we are aligned, talking. for sure. Yeah, yeah we're aligned. <laughs> <laughs> I have a last question to the panel, and in fact to uh, Nick, Iran, and, 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 and Francis, is that aside from product development, let's forget for one second new product development, what type of research do we need? So really research to improve quality of care, quality of life, life expectancy with the existing products and current knowledge. What, what would you recommend? Do you have any? Sure. There's, um, actually, this was uh, quite brought home to me yesterday when I was with this friend who's got EDS. Um, when I tried to help her to get into a wheelchair, I just, you know, I don't have much experience with wheelchairs, but I was just astounded at how poorly designed some of these things are. The battery was so huge uh, with some kind of Velcro thing kept on falling out. Um, the brakes kept on going. And I was like, I can't believe this. You know, we're in 2014, and um, it is just so badly designed. Um, so I think the first thing, actually, um, we could improve the design of the medical devices that we have. And this is something I hear about every evening uh, when I come home, because my wife is a clinical engineer at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge, and her passion is this area of design called human factors, which is this whole thing about how humans interact with machines and to try and minimize errors, but also to make these machines is much more user friendly. And so really it would be about making these devices with the patient at the center. You know, uh, really testing them, just like iPhones are tested with patients and all that. You know, so I, not with patients, with with, with, custo you know, with customers. Although increasingly, actually, with patients, because iPhones are turning into medical devices. Um, so I think that would be the first thing. Really, is kind of really kind of spending um, time and money on improving medical devices. And the second one, I think, would be um, good qualitative research on the impact of rare diseases on the individuals, because the impacts are huge. You know, the sociological impacts and economic impact of having a rare disease and psychological ones, I don't think are actually fully understood. Because when you speak to the patients, you know, there's a lot of common themes when you speak to them about the misdiagnoses, about the misunderstanding, about how the family reacts, about also the cascade of consequences. You know, when you start to lose your job, and then when your, um, your, your partner then has to go part-time to look after you, and your kids have to look after you, and just the kind of economic collapse that happens around that. I think if we had more research into there, we could then make an even stronger case for why developing treatments and care for rare disease is so important. Thank you, Nick. Then the question is to Iran. Iran, as far as you know, uh, is there any possibility in Horizon 2020 to fund these two types of research? So beyond medicine development in medical devices, for instance, but also that kind of more social research on the impact? Um, absolutely. So uh, we have also funded uh, medical devices and we will continue to do so in uh, Horizon 2020. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis also on the diagnostics because that is of course a vital area. Uh, also we know that there are many um, patients in rare diseases who are, as Evil just described in, in your session there, who are still waiting for a diagnosis. And I think we will also um, do quite heavily investments there and try to bring that area forward because um, there, the current rate um, of identifying genes is 150 disease genes per year. Um, that, of course, needs to be translated into diagnostic tests, and there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done there in terms of quality assurance, uh, standardizations of analytical procedures, etc. So, so that's a very important area for us. Um, but the, we are also going down another path that we haven't really done before. Uh, so this is new for us, and that we are actually going to 
go in and to fund pilots in healthcare. And we are starting with the first pilots of personalized medicine um, to really roll out personalized medicine into a local, regional, or national setting, um, in integrating all the components that you need um, in healthcare. We're also going in and, and funding uh, research into healthcare models. Uh, because we think this is something that really needs to be looked at, and we believe um, that uh, member states will not be too keen maybe to go in and really change and take up to these new innovations unless they really have the proof uh, that this is something that would be uh, financially viable or uh, really, really bring additional opportunities and benefits for patients. Um, so these are areas that we are going down that we haven't done previously at all and uh, we are reflecting further on sort of how we can you know really make a difference in this area and build up sort of the evidence base uh, for for those who are really implementing healthcare um, to see what models they could use thank you very much Irene. Francis I suppose it's not very polite but we I think we have to talk about money too um, so what sort for, I don't know why, but apparently the classic health economical rules do not apply for orphan drugs. Um, and I don't know how many financial experts or health economical experts there are in the room, probably any at all. But I think there should be, there is no reason why we, financing is going to be crucial for the next years too, I, for a lot of years coming now to, there should be, um, it should be studied, health economics of pharmaceuticals, uh, for, of orphan drugs should be studied a lot more. And it's very specific and it's very complicated, but it should be done because it's crucial and it's going to be crucial for, for continuing to give access. But apparently it's a, some sort of a, you can't talk about it. I can't resist. Health technology is such a it's such, health technology assessment is today in its infancy, and how paradoxical that we've learned everything we know about health technology assessment in the effect of drugs on old people or people so terminally ill that they're within months of death. What would the health economics of a life-changing therapy for 80 years in a child look like, and why do we know so little about that? Because to your point, it would really change and drive the discussion of the value of orphan drugs in a different way. I think it's a great point you raise. I'd love to have that discussion. I know we don't have time, yeah. But it's <laughs> Particularly that we have one question coming from the participants, a patient group on ALS in Belgium. So I guess that goes to you, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Saying that if we go back to the basics, basic needs, and make sure that everyone in Europe get uh, treated by a better health system. Uh, the fact of involving the patients in the discussion is a way maybe to enhance that solidarity because the, they can express the, 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 the needs and the discussions can be maybe more, uh, you correct me if I'm not telling your question properly, but the fact of having patients representative directly involved in this discussion about reimbursement will enable to uh, balance properly the needs. And if I may add to that question is that I'd like to refer to my own experience between today with the payers as we had maybe since 25 years with the regulators. Is that I remember a time with the regulators where patients were not welcome in the room because it was so obvious that the patients would only ask to have access to the drugs, that they wanted it anyway, whatever the data, right now. And that doesn't prove, doesn't come to be true. In fact, very often we are much more cautious than regulators because we don't see the evidence we want to see before we take the risk. But another situation, the trade-off of risk is that we want to have an earlier access. So here it's probably the same question when it comes to society and making the trade-off of where to allocate the resources that maybe patients don't fully feel represented only by the one making these decisions, but would like to be involved in this decision-making process. Francis, do you, do you see that first as a real uh, solution, and, and do you see that happening in the short term? Well, it, in Belgium, it is going to happen on a very short term. Next, and then next few weeks, the 
uh, the Royal, no, the King Baudouin uh, Foundation is going to start up discussions and um, um, discussions with patients and patients groups on uh, patient participation in the whole decision process. So uh, even in contracting, with the aim to really Im implicate or to, to put into action that patient participation from next year on, I think. Mid next year on, something like that. It will depend a little bit. This is Belgium and we have uh, elections in a few months and as you know, it takes a year and a half in Belgium to have a government after elections. <laughs> so it might take some more time. <laughs> but the aim is half next year uh, to, to have really patient participation in this decision process. But that's only for Belgium. I cannot speak for another country than for Belgium. But I understand it's coming also in some other member states, coming right? very fast, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. With that, I'd like to thank your uh, panelists for our discussion. Thank you very much for your thoughts and uh, openness. Thank you also for all your drive in these discussions, each of you, because in your respective unit, you have that drive. Thank you very much. Yes, you can.